Joining us now from Belfast is Claire Cromie, who is a close friend of Lyra's. And in fact, Claire, I mean, such a close friend that you were due to be her bridesmaid, weren't you? Yes, um, it was just about a week or two ago, she um, rang me absolutely ecstatic, um, telling me that she wanted to propose to Sarah, and we all love Sarah, um, and I was ecstatic for her. Um, we met up and just gave her a massive hug, and we were crying with happiness <laughs> at the news. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's an utterly cruel situation that you find yourself in now, that two weeks after you're crying with happiness, with her, you're now facing going to her funeral. What are your thoughts about Lyra today? Sorry, I couldn't hear that there. Just saying that it's so sad to, to watch you recount that story of her asking you to be a bridesmaid, the announcement of her uh, intention to get married. You know, there was such a happy period in her life, wasn't it? And today, two weeks on, was... you now go to her funeral, a terrible, cruel irony. Yeah, I don't think anybody, I don't think any of us can really comprehend it still. It'll take a while to sink in. In the last year, she got a book deal um, with Faber. She'd, you know, every time something big happened in her life, she'd be ringing me going, you're not going to believe what's happened. I'd be like, what now? Um, there was just a constant stream of great news. She was getting published in New York Times, got her book deal. There was talk about turning it into a TV show. She hadn't even finished writing it yet. Have you been able to find any meaning at all in this, this pointless death of a very gifted young woman? Uh, I think, I mean, we've all said any price is too high, kind of, but I suppose we keep just telling ourselves that some good has to come of this. Um, you know, Lyra's, her TED Talk was all about conversations, about talking to people that thought different things to what you thought and um, reaching out across uh, perhaps the political divide to talk to um, you know people you wouldn't consider your friends and understand their point of view and to see politicians coming together that's that's great that's exactly yes. what she would have wanted she would have wanted everyone to be talking yes well so thank you for thank you for speaking it will enact some change thank you for speaking for her this morning and uh, i hope all goes well uh, at the funeral at one o'clock and joining us now here in the studio is Lord Peter Hayne, the former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, and Marissa McGlinchey, who is an Assistant Professor of Irish Politics at Coventry University. And it's a question for you both, really. I mean, I think most of us covering this story are very surprised that we're covering the story. We thought all this had gone. We thought that those days were well and truly over. Is this just a ghastly blip, or are we beginning to see the crumbling of the Good Friday Agreement and the end of the peace process? It's a question for both of you. Well, in actual fact, when I watched the events unfold on Thursday night um, and the horror and revulsion that we saw over what happened to Lyra, uh, what came to mind to me was the fact that over recent years, there's actually been quite a lot of sustained activity from the new IRA. If you look at PSNI statistics, you see a lot of seizure of weapons and firearms. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the activity has been low level, but it has been sustained and it has been there. So are we living in a bit of a fool's paradise then? Are we, particularly here on the mainland, as we call it, are, are we kidding ourselves? That, that the problem's over. We've been neglecting the Northern Ireland situation now for a number of years, mm -hmm. and I say that as a former Secretary of State, that you have to grip it all the time, from mm -hmm. number 10 as Prime Minister through to the Secretary of State. And we've, in a sense, thought this is done and dusted yeah. because of the settlement we got, remember, when Ian Paisley <clears> and Martin <throat> McGuinness yep. shared power together, and I helped negotiate that, that it was all over. But as Marisa says, the dissident IRA groups, and they've taken various forms, you've written about it, are, um, have always been there. They never bought into the, the peace process that Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness led the provisional IRA in to uh, accept uh, and, and take forward. So they've always tried to, they've, they've killed, they've been fortunate from their point of view. On the other hand, they're very isolated and marginalised compared with the the IRA and how of the past. How politically and intellectually developed are they in their republicanism? I, I heard the parish priest who gave the last rites to Paul Lehrer um, on, on Sunday saying that he described them as kids playing war games. Um, is, is that a bit of a simplistic analysis? Well, I think it is, but uh, you know them. You've interviewed those people. What do you think? Um, well, their support base and their membership comes from a variety of people, including former 
provisionals, former members of the provisional IRA or Sinn Féin, um, but they also tap into disaffected youth, particularly in areas of Derry that would be high mm. activity. So what's truly motivating them? What do they really want? Uh, well, they describe themselves as traditional ideological Republicans, so they've never abandoned that Republican position um, of seeking a, an Irish independent United Republic. Mm. Absolutely. They describe themselves as hard left, revolutionary. And why is that so important to them? In, in the aftermath of the peace process, and the Good Friday Agreement, why is that still a kind of dream of a unified Ireland? Why does that well, matter? Well, the re Republicans of whatever stripe, including this new IRA, so-called, that killed Lear and McKee mm -hmm. uh, so terribly, uh, have always believed in a united Ireland. That hasn't gone away. Mm. The difference of the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process that followed is that it gave a democratic route to a new to a united Ireland right. through a referendum. From a unionist point of view, the referendum was a lock on the union with, with uh, mm. the rest of the United Kingdom. Mm. And so what they didn't accept was the Adams McGuinness provisional IRA, the mainstream IRA, if you like, buying into this democratic route. Mm. And what's so dangerous about the current situation, and Lyra McKee is a tragic victim of that, is we've got a vacuum with no politics, mm. with Stormont, the devolved self-government of Northern Ireland that had operated for 10 years from 2007, more or less successfully, suspended. So you've got a vacuum. And you find when politics is suspended, extremism fills uh, that, that vacuum. Yeah. And this is what's dangerous. And then there's the Irish border situation and yeah. all the uncertainty over that. Um, Lyra was obviously a talented promising, intelligent young woman. Is there an opportunity in the vacuum that she leaves behind to get a grip here in what... Well, in Suzanne, I on? hope so. But uh, I've been saying, as of others, for over two years now, this is Stormont as self-government has been suspended for over two years. But this shines a personal light. Does. And sometimes it, it takes mm -hmm. a tragic yes. personal event exactly. to sharpen people's focus. And she was a brave, fearless investigative journalist. Yeah. I mean, she was a serious journalist. She's just written this book called The Lost Boys about disappeared youngsters in, in mainly Belfast. Mm -hmm to be published. I hope it will be published yeah. as a testament to her. And what do but we... Yes, Sorry. I hope Sorry. that the politicians will not just turn up to her funeral today, as I'm sure they will, in large numbers, but actually do something about it. Exactly right. And what do we... Finally, what do we make of this pusillanimous apology? Where they're, in effect, saying, yeah, we, we, yeah, we got it wrong, we hit the wrong person, we'll, 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 we'll have a chat and we'll do better next time and we'll make sure we hit, quote, the enemy. What do we make of the apology? Well, there's been revulsion over the statement that was released by Siri, as well as the apology from the new IRA. But what we've seen, interestingly, is the community has come together, um, as Peter said, uh, in revulsion against this and the political parties have come together. But also, interestingly, even within what's called the so-called dissident Republican base, we've also seen revulsion within there. So we've seen... Are these terrorists Republicans. more isolated now in 2019 than their forebears were in, say, 1975? Are they more isolated as a group? Their levels of support are lower, they're minimal, right. as Sinn Féin continues to get the majority of support. And even it's, what's significant is that even within the Republican base, or the so-called dissident Republican base, people have come out in revulsion against this, yeah. and that's possibly where the pressure will come from on Enough this Enough revulsion for name and shame? Um, I'm Want not sure. I'm not sure if that will happen, but... Um... No. There's never been that tradition yeah. in, no. in, no. In, in the IRA. That's a line that's not crossed, isn't it? But it is different yeah. from the, the past IRA, the IRA yeah. of Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams and so on, who did enjoy, whether we like it or not, a reservoir of support that these people don't. Mm -hmm. Lord Peter Hain, thank okay. you very much indeed. Thank you. Marisa Inchi, thank you very much indeed as well.